This video is on the topic of measures of variation. We are interested now in determining factors of how scattered apart the data is versus central tendency of mean, median, mode, you know, how far out, are the data values close together, are they more scattered, things like that. And the simplest and most basic of measures of variation is range. Range is literally taking your maximum data entry minus your minimum data entry. It's just your largest number minus your smallest number. Now, if these are sorted from left to right increasing, it would be the number on the right minus the number of left on the left, but you don't want to assume that, obviously. You want to look, and you can see that this data set is clearly not sorted. So you find the largest value, which is 24, smallest value, 2, 24 minus 2 is 22. So range is basically that easy. But now we're going to get into a little more sophisticated uh, measure. And start to building that, we're going to use the idea of the, the deviation of a data value. And this is calculated the same whether you have population mean or sample mean. It is your data value x minus whatever the mean value is, either case. So sometimes that can be positive, sometimes that can be negative, or it, be, it can be zero. Now here's a data set. I'm just calling it a population for now because it's going to be different between population and sample, how we calculate this. Suppose we we know it's a population. It has these five values, 12, 13, 7, 5, and 9. So over here I'm calculating the population mean mu, the sum of the x's divided by uppercase n. 46 divided by 5, 9.2. All right, that's easy enough. Now, come over here and make a little chart to show the uh, deviation score, you might say, or value, whatever you want to call it, for each x. I've listed in the vertical table here. So to calculate the deviation, like I had written up here, you take the value minus the mean. So the first one's 12 minus... 9.2, which is 2.8, so forth, so on. You see you have some negative ones down here. That's fine. 7 minus 9.2 is negative 2.2. So, so um, let's suppose that we're going to say, well, why don't we, you know, if we're trying to measure the deviations to measure the scattered data, let's just average the deviations and see how far they scattered apart. Well, I took those five deviations. I added them together, divide by 5, I get 0. That would mean the average of deviations is 0, which that doesn't really tell us much. Because if a data, there's only one way that a data set could have no deviation in it, is if they were all the same number. Then they would have no deviation. Obviously, this data set has deviation in it, so that average of 0 doesn't help us. And another thing you may wonder was, was that an accident? A fluke? No. And I, I'm not going to derive it mathematically, but I can show formula-wise that it does always equal zero. So that would have been zero for any numbers I chose. So that's not really going to tell us much, and average deviations is no help at all. So what we're going to do is be to get rid of these negatives, because the issue is, is with both positive and negative, we're only interested in how far away it is from the mean. So the fact that 7 point minus 9.2 is negative 2.2, I'm more interested that it's 2.2 units away from the mean. I don't care whether it's below it or above it. It's the distance away from the mean. So to get rid of the negative, we create this column on the right. I guess where it's just x minus mu, where you square each value. Um, so you can call these the squared deviations if you want to. That's doesn't have an official name, but if you, so you square each deviation and add them together. Now, it, negative values are going to square to be positive. If you want to put them in the, if you want to put it in the calculator, you can just put them as uh, negatives. I mean, or as positives and square them. But one thing to keep in mind is for negative numbers, though, if you are doing it this way, you would have to put parentheses around it because. But if you put them in there as positive, it doesn't matter anyway. Because if you just type it like this, it's just a little trick with negative numbers. I want you to 
See there, if you don't put parentheses around, look what happens. You get negative. And none of the square deviation values are going to be negative. The reason why that's negative is because without parentheses, the square doesn't belong to the net. The negative is outside the square part. But, okay, so just to solve that problem is don't even, don't even take the negatives into consideration. Just square them as if they're all positive. So 2.8 squared is 7.84. And uh, so you saw that value. There, see, 17.64. That's the fourth one. So you square those and add those up, and you get 44.8. So, uh, so I just use that notation, the sum of the x minus mu squareds. So that doesn't really have a name other than, like I said, the sum of the square deviations. It doesn't have an official definition or anything. But now we're going to have an official definition, definition of, a, of a term. We have what's called the population variance. Variance is a term we use to measure the scattering of data. And specifically, we're dealing with just a population right now. We'll look at sample here shortly. So population variance, anything with a variance will have a square written above it because it's a squared value. That little funny looking O is not an O. It is a Greek letter. It's actually the lowercase sigma. You don't have to know that it's lowercase sigma. But I'll always be saying sigma, so it's, I guess it's good to recognize it. It's the it's the lowercase version of the, the zigzag sigma. So the population variance is calculated by taking the sum of the squared deviations and dividing it by our population size. So in this case, the sigma squared for population variance would be the sum of our squared deviations we got up here, 44.8, divided by 5, equals 8.96. So it's, it's not the average of the deviations that we saw earlier, which is always zero. It's essentially the average of the squared deviations for a population data set. Now the next measure... That re it relates to variance, and it's more commonly used actually than variance, is the population standard deviation. And the population standard deviation does not require, you know, much more involvement with the, with the data calculations. All you have to do for the population standard deviation is you take the square root of the variance. In fact, that's always true for any kind of scenario. If you know the variance, the standard deviation for anything is always the square root of that variance. So literally you just take calculator, you take the square root. So for this problem, the square root of that variance we got up there, 8.96, is 2.993. Once again, the number of decimal choices is arbitrary and you're just choosing the right answer. So you see I wrote that as a sentence. It will always be the square root of the variance. Now there's another way, if you're doing this manually, that you can do uh, the square deviations. That's what the numerator is for the variance formula, it's the square deviations. And this is going to, we haven't seen sample yet, but it's, it's just saying this is true for population or sample. Is right over here, and it's kind of tricky, but if you use, once you get used, I like it better because this in this formula, you don't have to subtract all the de you don't have to, you don't have to calculate each deviation where you take the x minus the mean. You only have to do subtraction one time. So this says you get the sum of the x squareds minus the sum of the x is squared divided by n, just the last part, not the whole thing divided. Believe me, if I wanted all that divided by n, I would have drawn a real big fraction and would have made it look clear. Uh, but the tricky part about this is that these two things look the same. The sum of the x squareds and the sum of the x is squared. They look the same, but they are absolutely not the same. So to use this method, you don't have to do the deviations. You don't have to do the x minus the means. All you need is the x's, which is your original data, right here. And then you square each value. So just take a calculator and go 12 squared, 13 squared, 7 squared, 5 squared, 81. 9 squared, which is 81. 
So you add up both those columns. So the squared deviations that I have right here is the sum of the x. So the first one means the sum of the x squareds. Means you, you, you square each x, like we did here, and add them up. It'll be that number 468. Minus its own fraction right here, the sum of the x's total, which is 46, and you square that total. So that's the difference. So the first one is you square each x and then add them up. And the second one is you add the x's up and square that total. So it's 468 minus 40, 46 squared divided by 5, which is your n. Now, you see I did that in the calculator and got 44.8. Okay, that's exactly what we got right here. Back up here. The 44.8. So one thing to keep in mind, I've seen people get confused with, they think that they're done with the entire problem when they get that. That's not the variance. Notice it says the numerator of the variance. It's just giving, it's another way that you can get the squared deviations if you want to do it that way. That's all it solves. But you still have to divide that number by 5 to get the variance. So you see that just only gives you the numerator. Just a different way to get it. Divide by 5, 8.96. Now, sample variance and sample standard deviation. Okay, unlike when we did means, you know, sample mean and, and uh, population mean were calculated the exact same way. These are not. There is one difference, one key difference. Now, not, I'm not talking about just the x bar instead of mu. That's still, that's not a big deal because it's still, the numerator is still the square deviations. It's the denominator. Instead of dividing by n, you divide by n minus 1. And the, for sample, we use s instead of, uh, instead of sigma. For sample, sample, so it's s squared. Once again, it has the square. Just like it's sigma squared for population here, it's s squared for uh, sample variance. And then, of course, sample standard deviation will be s, and, and any standard deviation is always the square root of its variance. Well, let's see, some down, somewhere down here, let me see if I included this at the end. Yeah, this is not important. You don't need to know this for an exam, but uh, so don't worry about this. But it, it, it sort of explains why you do the n minus 1. It's kind of a, and it, it, this is one of the better explanations I've seen that isn't too mathematical, but that's not your concern. You just have to make sure you do it. Let's get back to where we were here. Uh, now, I, I took that same data we used before, and I said, suppose it would have been a sample and not a population. So since I'm using the same numbers, of course, we'll have the same squared deviation. We, uh, but this time, we divide by 5 minus 1, not 5. So we divide by 4. We get a sample variance of 11.2, and then we get a sample standard deviation of 3.347. So there's the difference on the two variances. One, the population divided by n. Sample, you divide by n minus 1. I'm going to show you how to do this in the, in the calculator. Now, the calculator will only give you standard deviation. It won't give you the variance. But that's not a big deal because to go from variance to standard deviation, you square root. But to go from... From standard deviation back to variance, you square. So, for example, if I told you the standard deviation was 3, that would mean the variance was 9, 3 squared. Just like if you were told, for example, that the variance was 16, the standard deviation would be the square root, which is 4. So they just work opposite like that. So the calculator is not going to give us variance, so all we'll have to do is square our number. So it's that same one bar stats that I've shown before in the other video uh, on Central Tendency, how to find the median. Same command and everything. That's going to look a little different in this calculator screen, but mainly because one of the way you get to the one bar stats is here you have to actually scroll down and hit enter, but yours, 
on the 83 84 just hit enter stat edit edit means I want to build the list so um, 12 13 I should have these memorized but I don't 12 13 7 5 9 in any order 12 13 7 5 9 so they're all in there I can quit out of that second quit then I go stat calc first one one var stats see at this point you'll be able to hit enter I could probably just hit enter here but I'll always go down to but let me try it and see if that'll work usually I, I go down to calculate here let's just see no okay and this one enter just jumps me down in the next deal okay so I have to be on calculate but you won't but minor inconvenience so you see it shows the two standard deviations so let me go back to the notes here and so see SX S is, is for sample it's hard to get a little low the low with the hook that's your Sigma so this says the sample standard deviation should be 3.34 blah 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 and see there it is 3.347 go back up here to, and there's the stamp population standard deviation 2.993 and there it is in the calculator 2.993 okay so you're certainly free to do it that way but then as I mentioned though I to to actually get the the variance so I don't know if you really need to type in all those numbers or not I just, I just did it anyway they were all there but but I typed them in there and just went x squared and then you see it produces the correct variance as 11.2 well it really it's 11.2 it's not that big a deal but but look what you know I I only you see I didn't use all the decimal when it's close enough obviously so um, all right so if you need variance calculator okay I'm gonna skip through some of these these are just uh, now that I've explained the process these are um, same but I do want to without going through all the steps here I want to point out something here on this one uh, the idea you know standard deviation of variance is to measure how scattered the data is now what I did is I made up five numbers um, intentionally to have the mean 9.2 I wanted to have the same mean 9.2 as those other five numbers the 12 13 7 5 and 9 I believe but I intentionally made these closer together to have the same they have the same means so 12 they both have the same mean but obviously 12 13 7 5 and 9 are a little more scattered but notice how close together these numbers are so therefore with the same mean if they're closer together they're going to have lower variances and standard deviations that's, that's the purpose of this exercise so if you work it all out again and look at the answers they are smaller that tells you they're kind of closer together the population variance ends up being 0.56 and then the sample variance is 0.7 and then you take the population standard deviation Sigma square root would be 0.748 and then the square root of the uh, sample variance will give you the sample standard deviation, which is 0.837. Now you might be wondering why are the why are the standard deviations larger than the variances? Well, that's just a mathematical fluke, a numerical fluke that anytime you take the square root of a number smaller than one, it will become larger. But so that's why, yeah, if it, any number larger than one, and you take its square root that result will be smaller than what you took the square root of so that's no trouble here don't worry about that but that's the only reason that's just a, a, a fluke of numbers basically so so I wanted to do that just to kind of show and then there they there's the calculator command so like hey there's the numbers are closer together therefore the standard deviations and variances are smaller okay I'm gonna skip ahead on some of these so like I said this is this is just doing the same process you see I'm using the shortcut way I think yeah none of the I, I didn't do that deviation method but well if you like the deviation method that's fine of course then if you're also just using the TI calculator 
and you don't need to do any of this. You can do it like the way I showed you in the calculator. Or if you want to YouTube another video that shows you how to do it in the calculator, if you didn't like what I did. So I'm using that squared square shortcut formula because I didn't feel like doing it with the deviations too tedious. Now this is I use a, an Excel command to, to spit this out. Now Excel only shows sample variants. This is uh, an output that's part of that, what you would have to do for the uh, Excel assignment. Come up with that and I give the commands. I give the commands how to create that so it's no big deal. But uh, anyway, so you see that I did this manually, of course, using a calculator, but then so you see how the sample standard deviation is 3.4. There it is over here in our trusted calculator, 3.4365. And then there it is in Excel, 3.34. Okay, so just wanted to show you that. Now I want to mention that, you know, I, uh, you know when you're calculating variance, you know, you're sort of squaring the data values, which sometimes can kind of mess up units. But that's why standard deviation is more commonly used, because when you take the square root, it kind of gets all the units back in the same place you know dollars you just were dollars dollars squared would make no sense so but now variance is still used don't get me wrong but standard deviation is more commonly used now we're going to start looking at, at at ways how how mean and standard deviation work together they they team up real nicely and tell us information about data sets now suppose that we have a a symmetric and bell-shaped distribution. We're going to be talking a lot about this in the rest of the course, starting with the second unit forward. This curve here is going to be our friend over there. So it's a symmetric bell shape. I, actually, it's being redundant. Bell shape kind of is symmetric, so maybe I didn't need the word symmetric in there. It, well, at least I don't anymore. I can just say bell shaped. You could infer that means symmetric. So if our data plots like this, which, you know, I, I drew it as a curve, but then, you know, you, you're more likely now to see it as a histogram, but later it's going to be a curve. This statement, it doesn't matter whether this is a population or sample. I wrote, I wrote either or. There's no distinction on this rule. Because um, you, you just use, you're not going to be, you're not going to have to deal with both in the same problem. You know, just, you just use whatever mean and whatever standard deviation you're given to do this. It makes no difference. All right, this says if you create an interval, I'm using the square bracket notation for the interval, closed interval, um, between those two numbers, smaller number first. If you take the mean and you subtract whatever the standard deviation is, and write that on the left, then you take the mean and write, uh, add one standard deviation. So just hypothetically suppose the mean was... 100 and the standard deviation was 10. So you would have 100 minus 10 would be 90, and 100 plus 10 would be 110. This data says you would expect about 68% of your data to lie within one standard deviation of the mean. What that means is if you went through your entire data set and counted how many values fit in that interval, and then divided by the total number of values, you would expect that to be about 68%. Now, this works better with a larger number of data values. <coughs> More accurate. Well, I'll give you an example. If you only had 10 data values, there's no chance it could be 68%. Because if you had 10 data values, all the percents would be multiples of 10. 10, 20, 30, 40, 60, all the way to 100. Um, but it should be close to that. So let's say now, what if we took our mean and we subtracted two times the standard deviation and then added two times the standard deviation? That's going to create a wider interval, spread out farther. Like using my 100 and the 10 example, 100 minus 2 times 10 would be 80. 100 plus 2 times 10 would be 120. So if you're covering more numbers, it makes sense that you would have more that fit in there. So you uh, so then if you did the same process, if you went and count how many fit in that interval and divide it by how many total numbers you have, 
Now you're expecting about 95% of them to fit in there. So that's a lot of them. Now the last one is 3. Take the mean minus 3 times the standard deviation. Mean plus 3 times standard deviations. Create your interval. Count your values. You're expecting about 99.7% to lie within 3 standard deviations of the mean. So that's, you know, often some books will say virtually all. But that, that is virtually all the data. It doesn't mean it'll be all the data, but you, you would expect, wouldn't be surprised. So here's a good example of how we can bring outlier in there. You know, we've been talking about outlier in the other videos. You know, outlier is a data that's far, far removed. So any, any data value on a, on a bell-shaped distribution that's not within three standard deviations, you can safely say that's an outlier. All right. Now, so let's see. We have a data set with 60 mean and eight standard deviation. It did not matter whether it was population or sample. You just, you're just you going to be given one mean and standard deviation, so just use it. So this tells us it's bell-shaped. They could say use the empirical rule directly, because that's the name of the rule, the empirical rule. But bell-shaped implies it's the empirical rule. We have a different different name for another rule coming up lately. Later. Not lately, a little later. Um, so you see I took 60, so 60 and 8, so 60 minus 1 times 8 would be 52. 60 plus 1 times 8, 68. So we would expect about 68% to be between 52 and 68. So now I'm using two standard deviations. 60 minus 2 times 8, 60 plus 2 times 8 would go all the way from 44 to 76. That's a larger range. It's going to contain more numbers that would fit in there. So you would expect about 95% of the values to fit in that region. And then we take minus 3 times 8 and plus 3 times 8 for the third rule of the empirical rule. 1, 2, 3, standard deviations. And this gives us an interval from 36 to 84. And we would expect about 99.7% of the data to fit in that interval. Here's an example. I, I generated some data. Uh, you're not asked to do this on a test. Uh, if you do the Excel assignment, that's going to be on the Excel assignment. Um, you won't have to actually, I have it a little bit different on the Excel assignment. I don't make you actually generate the numbers. The numbers are already there. You just have to sort them. So what I did is, is I, I, I just basically generated 200 data. This, we're going to learn about this later, but normal distribution, we're going to be talking about that a lot, so you'll be familiar later. That is bell-shaped. Normal is bell-shaped. So the mean is 60, standard deviation is 8. I just use that random seed just to generate the numbers. I'll have different random seed will give you different numbers. Now, I, uh, uh, if you put them in a spreadsheet, it's going to put them vertically, but obviously I didn't want to put 200 numbers and waste a bunch of pages here. So I, I sorted them, and I put them in blocks of 20, so that's 10 blocks of 20. And they're sorted, so you see the smallest is 40.847, blah, 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 and here's 75. 77.652 on the high end. So I'm just I'm just testing to see, for example, how this data does compare to the empirical rule. That's all I'm doing. So obviously, if you you know use a different seed number and just diff generated different data, you'd get different results. So I'm using those same intervals that were generated in the last problem. So 52 to 68. If you go through here and count this, and literally you would start, you don't round this, you would start literally with the first number that crosses 52. So I don't use 51.98 right there below my box there. I would start with 52.10, and then up here I would go to anything before you get to, so it's got to be within 68. So 67.9, whatever the highest one is. So 67.99, then once I go over 68, then I don't want that. So um, 52.10 to 67.98, I count all those up, which wasn't as bad as it seemed because these are some of these are in blocks of 20, so all you got to do is just count them by blocks of 20, so it's not that bad. would have been terrible if they weren't sorted. 
But anyway, you get 136. 136 divided by 200. Well, that one turned out being spot on. That's exactly 68%. So it matched perfectly. Now the next one's 44 to 76. So I start with 44.02 and then go to 75.7. .7. Now counting this one's easy because the best way to do this is count how many of them aren't in there. The first three, the last two, 200 minus 5 is 195. 195 divided by 200 is 97.5. Okay, we were expecting, so on the right, to have the empirical rule, we were expecting 95%. We got 97.5%. A little off, but that's okay. And then 36 to 84, they're all in there. So we got 100%, which 100% is darn close to 99.7%. I would imagine a lot of times you, you would get 100% for that. So that's not uncommon. Well, like I said, that's 200 numbers. I would think that the, even the larger the data set, which we're not going to mess with, but, you know, you had several, several thousand. It should be pretty close to those. And this one didn't even do too bad for 200, so the more the better. All right, let's see. What do we have here? Uh, mean value sample forms is 2,400, standard deviation 450. Between what two values? Do about 95% of the data lie. Assume the data is bell-shaped. Bell-shaped is empirical rule. So you go back up here. Remember, you'll have these written down, so you don't have to memorize them. 68% um, is 1. 95% is 2. 99.7% is 3. So two standard deviations. So using my, if I'm teaching an in-person class, you know, when I, First thing they do is they look at uh, that two. And where did the two come from? Well, there's I just showed you where it came from. 95% translates to two standard deviations. So you just go by the, the, the definition of the empirical rule. 68 would have been one, and then 99.7 would have been three. So I'll take 2,400 minus two times the standard deviation of 450. I get 1,500. 2,400 plus two times 450 is 3,300. So you get between 1,500 and 3,300. So it's pretty, that's straightforward. Now this is asking a little bit differently here. It's giving the interval. And then you want to know what percent it is. It's going to be either one of those three percentages. So it tells you 80 is the mean. Standard deviation is 12. And we're saying what percent would you be expect to be between 44 and 116? Now, I kind of wrote this as an equation. You don't have to worry about that. But we are trying to figure out how many standard deviations away from 80 is both 44 and 116. It'll be the same. Just one of them is the same number of standard deviations below to get to 44 or above to get to 116. So what I just did, if you didn't want to do it algebraically, is I just took the calculator and went for the low end. I could have gone the high end. But I just took 80 and subtracted 12. And I just counted how many times I subtracted 12 to get to the number I was looking for. So you see, I took 80 minus 12 and did it three times. So therefore, 80 minus 3 times 12 equaled 44. So I know that 3 is my K. It's just the number of standard deviations. That's all. We'll be using that again. So 3 means, back up here, there it is. 3 standard deviations is 99.7. So it's all coming from those definitions of the empirical rule. And here's just another example. Uh, that one, I, did, I didn't do it in the calculator, but it wasn't too hard to come up with that one. Uh, yeah, you can look. You almost can look at this one and go 60 plus 13 is 73. So you know it's one standard deviation. So we're expecting about 68% from the empirical rule for one. If it would have, K would have been 2, it would have been 95%. So I think that's fairly straightforward. Now Chebyshev's theorem, a little trickier, but... Now, Chebyshev's theorem applies for data that's not bell-shaped. So this is really, a, you know, you're just making kind of a rough, rough estimate on this. It's, you're doing, it's like you're doing the best you can without knowing more information. It's not very precise. I mean, we're going to calculate a result here that we're going to get an exact answer, but it doesn't mean that the exact answer matches what the data really says.
So we can't even use one for this formula. But for Chebyshev, it says portion of the data within k standard deviations is 1 minus 1 over k squared times 100 is at least. This is very important. The wording on your answer has got to say at least. For the uh, empirical rule, it can just say about approximately something like that. It doesn't have to be. Um, it doesn't, but this has to apply at least, meaning we're not saying it's exactly that, but we're going to set this as a minimum and saying it could be higher than that. Now, the two that I'm, I'm you could really use any value for k greater than one, but this is not important enough in the scheme of things to get all that, you know, involved. I did one with four down here just for grins. But on a test question, I would expect two or three. So for two, and you don't have to recalculate this. We just use your notes. Two will just be 75% uh, because it'll be 1 minus 1 over 2 squared, which is 3 fourths. It ends up 75%. But you see the wording, at least. Make sure it says at least and not something like at most or about. For Chevy Chev, it's got to say at least right there. And then 3 is 88.9% for 3. And I did 4 which is 93.75. But just to give you an example, like I said, it's not picking on the Chebyshev theorem, but it's doing the best it can, can for unknown data. But you would not want to use this in place of the empirical rule, because this would, because uh, we learned in the empirical rule, two standard deviations would be not about 95%. We see how conservative this estimate is. Now, at least 75%, you know, or higher. So you see that's, Kind of a it's not very good, is it? Uh, you'd rather have for the empirical for bell shape. You'd rather use the empirical rule because that tells you it's more precise. But like I said, this though is taking data that could be they don't know skewed right, skewed left, anything that's not bell shape. So anytime you see a problem that specifies data that's not bell shape, you use Chebby Chev. Okay, we have a mean, 57.07, 1.05. The shape of the data is unknown. See, there you go. I mean, the problem may tell you on a test to use Chevy Shed. It may say so. Just like another problem may say to use empirical rule. But it doesn't have to. Empirical rule just has to say bell shape. This says anything but bell shape. It could say unknown. It could have said, I could have changed that to skewed right, skewed left. Any wording like that would lead to Chevy Shed. Okay, so at least 75%. We know from up here is 2. So we just take our mean, which is 57.07, minus 2 times standard deviation 1.5, plus 2 times 1.05. And see the wording here? At least, at least 75% lie between 54.97 and 59.17. Okay, very important with the at least. Now here's another one where you're working backwards, so you see what I did. This time I added instead of subtracted, but I need to know what that K number is. Distribution skewed right. That means Chevy Chef for sure. Mean of 60, standard deviation 3.2. What percents between 50.4 and 69.6? So I just went with the upper end. I could have done the like last time. I could have done minus and went to the lower end, but I decided to do it different to show you. So I took 60 and I kept adding 3.2, however many times it took to get to 69.6. It took me three times. Therefore, my value K is 3. And from right back up here, we got a result for 3 right here, don't we? K is 3, 88.9. It's possible it may say 89% on a test. Don't let that trick you, but there, were, there wouldn't be two separate answers, one with 88.9 and one with 89. That's not going to happen. Once again, we got to have at least 88.9 would lie in that interval of 50.4 and 69.6. All right, that takes care of the empirical and the Chevy Chef. Now we're going to move to another type of measure called the uh, standard score, also known as the Z score. This value that you calculate basically represents how far or how many standard deviations 
a certain data value falls from the mean. For example, if your data value had a z-score of 2.5, that means its value is two and a half times the standard deviation added to the mean. Or if, if uh, the z-score can be positive, negative, zero. If your z-score was negative two, that means your standard devia uh, your, you know, your value is two standard deviation units lower than the mean. In other words, if you took the mean, subtracted standard deviation two times, that would get to your value, your data value. So once again, this does not matter whether it's mean, uh, uh, population, or sample. I wrote it both ways. But what I have written over here in red to the right, that's really all you need to worry about because you don't have to make the distinction between mean and, uh, and population and sample. Although uh, in the second unit of the course, when we get to the normal distribution, it's going to always be done the way on the left. So you'll, you'll be used to seeing that. But for now, the calculation, it makes no difference. So you just take whatever data value they want you to calculate the z-score. You subtract the mean. That's got to be given. That'll be given to you. And then subtract that and then divide all that by the standard deviation. Okay, I'm not going to read these out loud. It's not important that you know those by heart. So, okay, I said suppose we had a uh, data set with mean 52, standard deviation 8. Find the z-scores for these values. So you take 64 minus the mean, 52 divided by 8 is 1.5. The next one, 38 minus 52 divided by 8 is negative 1.75. And the last one, 52 minus 52 divided by 8, 0. So you see the last one had a z-score of 0 because its value was the mean. The score was 52 and the mean was 52. So that would always be 0. Not that you have to know that when you recognize it, but when you calculate it, you're going to get zero every time anyway. Now, uh, for what I would ask on a test, this is what we're going to do. Now, sometimes, you know, in different different applications, and the, the better the z, the higher the z score, uh, uh, not always better, but it is for this kind of problem that I tend to ask on a test when you're talking about something that would imply that a better score like test scores um, obviously that would mean the larger the z score better but to give you an example of something where a lower z score would be better is let's say if we calculated uh, monthly electric bills in the Houston area in July and you had the mean and you had the standard deviation that would be an example where you, and, and you had your z-score for whatever your amount you paid based on that information. Uh, that would be an example where you would want a negative z-score would be good because that would mean that your value that you that you paid was below the average. So in that case, the more negative if possible z-score would ideally be better in that case. But for what we'll have for testing purposes, it'll be like this where the larger would be better. So let's say you're taking, you know, two different exams here. And we have a statistics exam. The class average was 80 and the standard deviation was 10. And then there was a, an accounting exam, which appeared to be more difficult because it had a mean of 65, but a standard deviation of 12. Now what we're doing is so our student here scored a, a 90 on the stats test and an 80 on the accounting exam. Now, what we're trying to measure is we're trying to measure which one has the better relative position to the rest of the class. So what we're trying to say is, so notice both those scores are above the mean for this student. So we're trying to, it's, it's measuring a ranking, essentially. The higher the z-score means that would have been a higher rank. You would have done better than more people. So the larger the z-score means you would have ranked higher in that particular group. So you don't look at it and say, well, 90 on stats is better than 80 on accounting, so you, that's the determining factor. That's not it at all. You calculate the z-score she made for the stats exam, then the z-score for the accounting, then the higher one's the better. There could be a tie, but don't don't round. It would be an exact tie, like if it was uh, 1.25 and 1.25. That would be a tie, so it would be equal. So the z-score for her stats would be 90 minus the mean stats, which is 80, divided by 10 is 1.0. That means her score 
was one, the z-score was 1.0, meaning it was one standard deviation above the mean. Now in the accounting exam, the score was 80, minus 65 mean, divided by 12, is 1.25. So actually, she did better than more people, if that makes sense, on the accounting exam. If they would have ranked scores highest to lowest, she would have been ranked higher with that 80 in the accounting class than actually than she would have with the stats exam. Hopefully the accounting exams might be adjusted there toward the end. Maybe an 80 will turn into an A at some point with such a low, low class average, but that's, that's not for us to be concerned about. But so technically, uh, she ranked higher in the accounting group with that score of 80 because her, her Z score was farther above the mean. Now we have uh, one last measure here, coefficient of variation. Coefficient of variation is used to compare two different data groups with different means and, and different standard deviations. Now I did that example earlier where, where that very first one where I showed you how to calculate mean and standard deviation where it had the mean of 9.2 and then I made up an, another example there but also where I put the numbers closer together that was the one that had the mean of 9.2 also but I showed you the numbers were closer together therefore that would have a smaller standard deviation well that's you know so I did that on purpose because that way I was kind of comparing apples and apples if they have the same mean and you can see they're closer together they're going to have larger uh, they're going to have a smaller standard deviation but you can't do that if the numbers don't, if they don't have the same mean, because the reason why is when you have larger numbers, even if they look closer together, they're they're going to produce larger results. The standard deviation, so you can't visualize the numbers when they're larger. You have to. It's comparing apples and oranges. It might look closer, so it just wouldn't be a fair comparison. If the means are the same, like I did earlier, then it was a fair comparison. But this is a real easy calculation. It doesn't matter whether it's population or sample. So the way you kind of compare the groups is you take a, the standard deviation of a group of data divided by its mean and then multiply it by 100% because these are generally in percentage answers. And then there you go. So the one that has the, the whatever the, so the, the one with the smaller standard uh, coefficient of variation would be deemed to be the one that, really fluctuates less. Uh, so the larger coefficient of variation would actually give you a better measure of being more scattered. Um, so like you look at this data set, here's one with a mean 50 and standard deviation 20 and another one with a mean 200 and standard deviation 40. So that's what I was talking about with the means being different. If those means were both the same, like if they were both 50, then the one that has a standard deviation of 40 would clearly be more, more variation in the data if they have the same mean. But that's not the case here because they're different means. So we have to use the coefficient of variation to compare them. So 20 divided by 50, standard deviation on top, mean on bottom. Right up there, be careful you don't reverse those. 20 divided by 50 is actually 40%, but the other one's 40 divided by 200 which is 20%. So in actuality, the one that had the higher standard deviation, we would say that data set actually has less variation. But it's because the numbers are larger. Like I was saying earlier, if the numbers are larger, it's going to make the standard deviation automatically be larger too. So yeah, so actually that data we would consider to be less scattered in its group, less change than the first one. So okay, so that's a good way to kind of compare apples and oranges and make them the same. Um, Ah, this example is kind of silly because I guess you don't really choose uh, salaries at random or whatever. This is kind of showing, let's just say this company has a history, the average salary being 50000 with a standard deviation of 5000 But the other one has a higher average, 55000 with a standard deviation of 12000 So the second one has a higher mean, but it also has a higher standard deviation. So if you calculate those two coefficient of variations, if you got a job there, it's less, it's, it's not as risky, lower coefficient of variation here because it is, so you, you don't have a chance to get a higher, but you don't have a chance to go as low either on the, on the salary scale as it would be with the one that has the larger. That's, 
Uh, so you see 5,000 5, divided by 50,000 versus 12 divided by 55. All right, so it's the least amount of risk for job A. So you're, you'd be closer to 50,000 a month. And that concludes this video.